And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. First, Kaylin Bowman is a roadrunner. She earned her doctor of pharmacy degree from Rosemans Henderson campus in 2007. She also earned a master's of science in pharmacy medication therapy management from the University of Florida. She serves as a clinical adjunct faculty member for Rosemans College of Pharmacy and is managing the medication therapy management program offered by Rosemans SHIP Call Center. Dr. Bowman also provides medication therapy management services in collaboration with the Rosemond Medical Group of Healthcare Providers. Dr. Bowman is truly an expert in this field, and I know we're all eager to hear her presentation. And with that, welcome, Dr. Bowman. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, uh, Brenda. I appreciate that. And I'm so excited about being able to present a topic that um, I enjoy and I actually practice um, here in Southern Nevada. And so uh, briefly, this is about pharmacists providing MTM or medication therapy management services to patients living with diabetes um, as uh, supported through a grant from Dignity Health. And that's what I'm disclosing here is that this is a funded program and also in collaboration with Roseman. Um, also, I am a consultant pharmacist with RX Healthy Living. I'm an owner and founder of my own uh, business so that I'm able to provide these services. Uh, today, I'm going to discuss the starting point for MTM, value versus volume, effects of non-adherence, and the development of MTM standards, and then how to integrate that into patient care, including patient-centered care, how to tailor treatment for social context, and the diabetes standards uh, of care for 2021. Finally, um, I'll talk about the, my current MTM projects, including the referrals for my programs, looking at diabetes self-management education and support services here in Nevada, Southern Nevada and other resources that are available. And I'd like to finally talk about expanding services, including the scope of practice for pharmacists in Nevada. To start, Medicare Modernization Act of 2003 is what required Medicare Part D. And this allowed for the medication therapy management services for the selection of beneficiaries with the following goals, to provide education, improve adherence, detect adverse drug events, and reduce medication misuse. Then later on, we had the Affordable Care Act of 2010. This increased the access of health care for patients here in the US. And in, allow the patients to um, stay on the plans, their children can stay on the plans longer, and it expanded um, eligibility from Medicaid. And so these are the two uh, healthcare acts that really expanded medication therapy management services for pharmacists to talk with patients. And so how did this affect the shift from volume to value? So the idea now is that we want to, instead of the number of scripts filled, we're looking at value, which is the outcomes of patient's health. And that is centered around the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services star ratings. And this is to empower patients or the beneficiaries to make healthcare decisions that will help them live healthier. It's a triple aim for undergoing change to better care for the individuals, better health for populations, and then the lower per capita cost. And some models that we're seeing for the value-based care, reimbursements and shared savings is something that we are still looking at developing and utilizing in real time. And this is where providers and payers are rewarded for assuming population health risks and lowering overall costs. And this is to help improve the quality of the care that we're offering patients. So what is the CMS and Five Star Rating? So pharmacists are in the forefront of responding to the change in healthcare. The demand for quality increases um, the MTM services. So you might be offering more MTM services over the last few years as the five-star ratings are becoming more prevalent. You want to be a valuable member of the healthcare team and share the rewards and value-based reimbursement. So the more opportunities you have to engage in the five-star ratings and patient outcomes, the more that you as a uh, entity or organization get reimbursed for these services. And again, pharmacists are nationally recognized to help curb healthcare spending while improving patient outcomes. So what, how does this affect um, patient care? Well, non-adherence is one of the uh, biggest issues across the population where 
patients may get a prescription. And of those prescriptions written by providers, only 50% actually make it to the retail setting. And of those, half are only taken correctly. So at any point in time when you're talking to patients picking up their medications, there's an opportunity to counsel or engage them in conversations to figure out if they are actually taking their medications and taking the medications correctly. How does this affect the economic burden of non-adherence? In 2012, a review of the Annals of Internal Medicine estimated that the lack of adherence causes a cost health care system about 100 to 300 billion a year. And when examined later in 2018 at the um, how pharmacists could have optimized the medication therapy, it was closer to 500 billion that cost the healthcare system for non-optimization of healthcare of the medications. How does this impact um, us as a society? Well, we have disease progression and complications, increased healthcare costs, decreased quality of life, and then hospitalization and long-term healthcare admissions. So what is non-adherence and what are the reasons? Well, first of all, it's more than just forgetting to take your medications that day. That, that does happen and that's something that we can help patients better monitor but we have to look at the other dimensions of non-adherence, including therapy-related, patient-related, healthcare system and team care-related, social economic factors, and condition-related. What's really interesting is that these non-adherence reasons um, actually fill into uh, impacts. So under social and economic, you can have things such as homelessness or lack of healthcare or health insurance medication costs are too great. And if you go over to patient related, now we're talking about patients being able to understand their healthcare, knowledge of the disease, and the perceived benefit of being on the medications. For therapy related, we can look at the complexity of their medication regimen, side effects, and how it interferes with their lifestyle. Under condition related, they may have other chronic care conditions. They have um, lack of symptoms. Why should they take medication if they don't feel sick? Um, depression and mental disorders may affect how they take their medications in general. And then healthcare related. Healthcare related is the patient provider relationship, patient education, their literacy level, and lack of knowledge on adherence. They don't realize how much missing a pill here or there during the week total affects their health. What's interesting is if I go back up to your dimensions of non-adherence, these also fall into the five domains of social determinants of health. If you're unfamiliar with social determinants of health, the CDC has a really great website that you can go in and they have the current uh, goals for 2030 for healthy people. But how to address social determinants of health is to improve patient health outcomes. And you need to be able to screen for the social determinants of health identify your patient's needs, refer them to appropriate community resources. And I think this is where pharmacists have an opportunity within their organizations, within their um, pharmacies to help guide patients to resources outside in the community. One good resource, if you're not available, uh, familiar with it, is nevada211.org. And it's a, a website that was put together. And if, you look at it, it allows you to um, look at resources available in Nevada, and this helps you find um, assist housing assistance programs, um, healthcare, food, if they have a food issue, um, and there's a crisis hotline. So resources that you may not be uh, familiar with or you feel that your patient might need, there um, are opportunities to find those within our community. Another great website and a source I've used quite often over the last couple of years is the Everyone Project. And the Everyone Project is through the American Academy of Family Physicians. Um, what I like about um, this Everyone Project is not only does it find resources based off a of zip code, it allows you to actually screen for the social determinants of health. So if you don't have the screening tools or not sure what to screen for, um, the Everyone Project has that tool available for you. 
And so it is actually your social needs screening tool where, tool where it looks at housing risks, food insecurity, transportation, if they need help with utilities, childcare, are they looking for employment, education, finances, personal safety, and um, if they want assistance, sometimes people may not be looking for assistance. Another thing is when you're screening for these uh, social needs, do you need to address every social need at that visit? You may want to identify what's the most important social need based off the patient's uh, voice or what they feel is most important to them. And then over time work on helping them find the others that they need. So what's really great about the Neighborhood Navigator is that you can um, look it up by putting in a zip code. So I'll just put in a zip code here in Henderson and it pulls up the opportunity to find programs. Again, it's very similar to uh, Nevada 211 where you can actually look at food or food pantries, emergency food, uh, food delivery, help paying for food. And that goes along each topic. And I've used this um, to help patients find um, emergency housing support if they were had an eviction notice and they don't have a place to, to go to. Um, Temporary shelters is a good one also to find a way to recommend what's near them that they can find a temporary shelter for safety, especially in this heat or in the cold of, of winter. So this is a, I, I really like this. And if you ever um, need to refer somebody for social services, this is a great site to go to. What else the Everyone Project allows for is once you screen, which is important, knowing where to refer them is also important, but that is part of developing an action plan. And so again, this is a great source for if you want to identify what is important to what you and your patient want to focus on and identify what are the resources nearby for their um, screen social need. And so this has a actual action plan that the patient can then leave with. So how do we develop the MTM standards? The MTM standards have the core elements of MTM, patient-centered process, and then documentation. Um, the core elements of MTM service model is through the APHA uh, medication therapy management. And this was basically published in 2008. And this is kind of what the SEMA standards are based on for if you're utilizing outcomes or if you're submitting um, MTM uh, sources for at your work or organization. This is where it was built on. And it has the five components, which is the medication therapy review, which includes all medications, including herbals, um, non-prescription, OTC, and prescription medication. I also, in the re interview, ask about um, creams, topicals, inhalers, um, insulins that might be in the fridge, eye drops, um, OTC, things that might be in the bathroom cabinet or on top of the fridge, wherever they keep extra um, medications that they might not consider medications. Having patients have um, their bottles with them is also very helpful. There you can develop a personal medication record. So now you can record all items um, very thoroughly and completely based on what they actually use. And after, during the interview, you can identify the medication related um, action plans for the patient, identify interventions, develop um, possible referrals if they need um, more help, and then finally figure out when would you like to follow up with them. So what is medication therapy management or MTM? I often get this question, not only from patients, but from students that I have on rotation and other pharmacists that may not be familiar with this um, service. So it's a service or group of services that optimize therapeutic outcomes for individual patients is the official definition. And it can include medication therapy reviews, like I just mentioned, but it can also be a pharmacotherapy consult and anticoagulation management immunizations, health and wellness programs, and other clinical services. These all can fall under a medication therapy management. And basically pharmacists provide MTM to help patients get the best benefits of their medications by actively managing drug therapy and by identifying, preventing, and resolving medication-related problems. One resource I use is the APHA MTM Central 
which um, they just did redid their um, website, but I was able to re update my link. And so pharmacists provide care, and this is the MTM services. And if you like to, um, you can go and observe or go through and look at these different tools that APHA has. Um, some links and some tools downloads require um, a membership, but most of this you can look at without a membership. And so if you want to learn more about other services or resources to find out how to utilize these services, they are at this link. For those of you who are getting the slide set, I did identify um, all these links um, as part of the PDF so that if you want to um, observe these on your own and do more research, you'll have that as um, part of your PDF. What are some examples of MTM interventions? Uh, patient is taking unnecessary medication. I often run into this one with patients who are taking a OTC herbals, vitamins. Um, they duplicate the vitamins in multiple uh, ingredients. And that's one way I find unnecessary medication. A needed medication has not been prescribed. This one I usually see with um, statins with diabetes. Um, the statin hasn't been um, discussed or it's not on file. Um, the patient doesn't understand the benefit of it. And so it's a needed medication. A medication is ineffective. So they might be taking a medication that is not providing, it's not um, getting their blood pressure or their glucose levels under target or as recommended. And therefore you may, may need to discuss um, with the provider adjusting that therapy. Medication is causing side effects or adverse reactions. The common one I find with this one is a cough with um, an ACE. Uh, lisinopril is a common one. Or I ask about um, swelling of the ankles or hands with um, amlodipine. That's another one I usually follow up with. Lightheadedness or dizziness or um, with beta blockers. So knowing to identify certain uh, common uh, side effects with medications they're on, it's a good time to ask the patient if they're experiencing them. They might not even realize that they're having side effects um, from medication. Patient is not taking medication appropriately. This is a really interesting one because I find that patients sometimes may not read the directions on the bottles. The directions may have changed. They may have understood one direction from the office visit and it's explained differently on the bottle directions, which they may not have read very carefully. So having the patient explain to me how they take their medication is a, a very valuable way to interview a patient when they tell me how they're taking it versus me just reading off the directions from the bottle. Um, that is a really enlightening way to find out if the patient knows how to take a medication and is taking it correctly. And those are just some of the um, common ones I've run across with doing my interventions. So who needs medication therapy management services? And this can be all types of people. Uh, commonly most recognized chronic diseases, uh, if they're on multiple medications, high out-of-pocket expenses, they may have complicated medication routines, um, unsure of why or how to take their medications. They're not sure if they should take them all together, space them out through the day, take some in the morning, some at night. Um, so that's a good way to find people who might need help and they're taking herbal vitamins and OTC in, um, in addition to their prescription medications. So often I've asked students, do you know that you are actively providing MTM services in the pharmacy? And so individually these um, tasks may seem like something that you're just being asked to do, but when you look at them collectively, they are actually MTM services. Adherence calls, when you need a refill or need drug therapy, the patient needs um, education or we're converting a 30 to a 90 day uh, fill. That is a MTM service. Medication synchronization, this is also medication service and MTM service. Drug interactions, I know I have, um, that's like a daily effort to call about drug interactions, especially uh, not only between drug-drug interactions, but drug herbals, OTC interactions. If they're on a high-risk medication, a lot of times that's under the beers list, um, where you find um, elderly on medications that can affect a risk for falls. Right now, I know we're all in the vaccine mode, 
Um, but vaccine recommendation beyond COVID is still very important to make sure they stay on schedule, identifying patients who might need their Shingrix or their pneumonia shot. Um, and flu season's coming up. So that's gonna be another big uh, task for um, us pharmacists in the community pharmacy. And finally, comprehensive medication reviews. These um, really require time and putting the patient plan together so that when you do have that chance to talk to the patient, um, they're ready to talk to you and give you their attention and you can actually ask them a complete uh, interview of what they're taking, document it, and provide the action plan necessary that's required for a CMR. So in the process of providing these services, pharmacists need to be able to have a, a common way to talk to patients in a process, which is called the patient care process. Um, this has been developed over time. When I went to pharmacy school, we really didn't have a common theme for taking down and collecting data that we all kind of associated with. So it's really nice to see something that has some uniformity in a way to talk to each other about how the patient care process should occur. So patient-centered care is in the middle. So you have to look at the patient themselves and figure out how are we gonna help each patient individually. They're unique and they can't be all treated the same. So collaborate, communicate, and document is very important. As you collaborate with the other providers, you communicate with them things that you may find in the um, interaction with the patient. And then you have to document it, whether you document it in um, the uh, program that you're utilizing, if you're documented in your organization's system, finding a way to document your work is very important. So this is created to include both a contemporary and comprehensive approach for pharmacists to deliver patient-centered care at the core while collaborating with members of the healthcare team. So what are some things that we may want to do to collect the patient data and medication use? Um, one thing I really enjoy is the three U.S. public health service questions. What did the doctor tell you this medication is for? How did the doctor tell you to take it? And what did the doctor tell you to expect? I like using this as a way to talk to patients if I'm counseling them or about the medication in their hand so that I can find out what they already know or what we're told or what they're using it for so that I can better uh, tailor my part of where I can add to their knowledge base or answer questions. When you conduct a focused interview, you want to know what all the health conditions are that the patient has and what they're going to the provider for. What are all the medications that they take? And what happens when they take them? Do they feel that it's helping them? Do they feel that um, they're getting a benefit from it? Because that's important for their own perceived benefit to take medication and know that it's gonna help them with their disease states. And what are some barriers in data collection? This unfortunately it does happen. You get caught up in the conversation. You forget to document uh, what they might be talking about. Um, you might have scratch paper where you write things down and it's not actually data that you forgot to ask them that you would be on the form. So this is um, something that you have to practice and become familiar with. So leaving empty spaces on your forms, you forget to ask it or you forget to fill it out. Um, there's a lack of space to collect the data. Sometimes you need a larger space for some patients to document all the concerns and questions. And some missing information, and that can be just due to the patient doesn't remember. They don't remember when they got immunizations or where they got them. They don't remember exactly what the doctor told them at the office. And so sometimes you may not be able to get the whole picture at the, at the um, interview with the patient. So what should they take home from some of these uh, reviews? Uh, the patient medical record is a list of all their medications, prescription, herbals, vitamins. It should be a complete list, including strengths, directions, um, why they're using it, if they are having side effects or unique ways to take it, if they're taking it at night or without food or with food. This is a good time for them to update that record. The other is a medication action plan. And the action plan should be prioritized um, not only on the urgency of the situation you may have uh, found out with talking to the patient, but also what the patient wants to prioritize. Um, what you find important, the patient may not find as important. They have other interests. So finding um, a, making the list and prioritizing it 
it's important that both you and the patient are on the same page. So how do we put this all together? So integrating MTM into patient care. This is a very um, daunting effort. Some may find it more difficult than others, but the idea is that you have to practice. You have to make the effort and try to find ways to incorporate, even if you do small steps such as making adherence calls, um, just talking to them about their medications, starting to document some of your conversations is a good way to start when you want to integrate MTM into your patient care. One thing to keep in mind is that it has to be patient-centered. You have to keep that unique patient conditions and tailoring the treatment to social context is what I'm gonna focus on along with some current updates with the Diabetes Care 2021. So how can we improve patient care through collaboration? I have found that over the last couple of years in learning to work outside um, a uh, pharmacy out into the community and working with different organizations and provider practices, that collaborating not only with my colleagues, allowing me to have a more meaningful recommendations to patients and healthcare providers, but collaboration with the other providers, healthcare providers, it improves patient outcomes. When you and the provider are on the same page and working together to uh, communicate, the patient will win, they'll meet their goals. It should be team-based approach and you want to close care gaps and improve coordination of care. And then again, documentation. Find out what, if the provider has a certain way of documenting things or identifying how to document, we as pharmacists need to learn how to communicate with them so that it's not a, uh, a missed opportunity to communicate and collaborate. So talking about communication style and patient-centered care, is that you should optimize the patient health outcomes. Patient cent person-centered, strength-based language, active listening to elicit patient preferences and beliefs, and you need to be able to assess literacy and numeracy and potential barriers to care. You really have to have that patient in mind of how they're gonna optimize their care. And what are five key consensus recommendations for powering language? You want to use neutral, non-judgmental, and based on facts, actions, or physiology, biology. You want to be free from stigma. You want to be strength-based, which means respectful and inclusive and imparts hope. This is not um, the time, I, I've had patients come to the pharmacy in tears after leaving some offices appointments because they received news that they weren't ready for or they were um, felt they were reprimanded by the provider for their, their lab work. And so when you work with patients, you wanna make sure that you impart some hope um, on their health outcomes. You want to foster collaboration between patients and providers as a team. And again, person-centered, the person with diabetes, not a diabetic. And that's a good way to start talking and conversing with patients. What do I mean by tailoring for treatment for social context? If you've ever read a uh, the Diabetes 2020 or 2021, there's a, uh, the very first introduction, the chapter one discusses this tailoring treatment for social context. So if you have not read the introduction chapter, uh, the second half, it goes into social determinants of health and it starts identifying how to take a more individual take on patient care. The very first one is tailoring for food insecurity over 14% or one in seven in the US population is food insecure. There are two questions that the patient can answer. And when they answer yes to either question, it doesn't have to be yes to both, that you have a sensitivity of 97% and a specificity of 83%. And what that basically means if they answer yes, they need help. They need help with their food. It means they're not having enough to last through the month and it runs out before they get paid again. And that's really important, especially during this pandemic this last year, there was a lot of issues with having access to uh, funds, monies, jobs, job security, and access to food, including um, school age, being at home, trying to get that food to the children in the homes that need it. Food insecurity leads to increased risk for uncontrolled hypo, excuse me, hyperglycemia and severe hypoglycemia. And this is due because 
They may have access to foods at the beginning of the month or at payday. And then near the end of the month, they have access to less, um, uh, might be more carb heavy, maybe more inexpensive, easier to access um, fast food, or um, they have to be able to access the cost of medications versus food. And so this is a very important thing to understand is that not everybody has the ability to manage their medications and their food um, and their finances. And that can affect um, their status of their diabetes. Some resources that um, I have found include WIC for women, infant, and children, uh, TFAP, which is actually been uh, re-identified, uh, which is the Emergency Food Assistance Program, and that's through the USDA. Uh, there's foodpantries.org, feedingamerica.org, and even here in town, we have um, a lot of programs and pantries. And if whether you go to 211.nevada211.org or the um, Everyone Project, which is the Neighborhood Navigator, there's ways to find food pantries in your local zip code. The Just One Project is one of Nevada's largest mobile pantries and they will advertise when they have their pop-ups around town. Usually they're at some um, schools, neighborhood schools is where you can find those. And then the Southgate Learning and Resource Center has uh, a monthly farmer's market. And so knowing what's available as a pharmacist, I think is very important, especially when you have patients at the counter or talking to them in person and they're making that decision of accessing food and you're saying, well, you need to learn how to make better dietary choices. Um, how can they if they don't have access to food? Another tailoring treatment for social context is homelessness. What's the risk of homelessness or are they homeless? And so barriers to diabetes self-management, food insecurity, uh, literacy, lack of insurance, cognitive dysfunction and mental health issues can all be issues and barriers to a patient receiving care for um, their condition of diabetes. And so where is a secure place for them to store their diabetes supplies? And how are they gonna store insulin if they even have the insulin prescribed if they're homeless? And working with a social worker to facilitate temporary housing is very helpful. And I'll talk about social workers and um, healthcare, uh, how they can help us bridge this um, effort is very important. I'll be on my next slide. There, um, I looked up a lot of resources, including homeless shelter directory. Um, if you click on it, this site, you can click on the state and then it will tell you what your homeless shelter directory is and how to find something near you and where you live in Nevada. There's also um, the women's shelters, shelter listings, the Salvation Army, National Healthcare for Homeless Council has more resources. There's the Nevada Homeless Alliance.org, along with events to help um, those who are homeless get services at um, where they collaborate all together in one location and they can get the care they need from table to table. It's really a, a great opportunity. Then they have resource guides for homeless services. Um, which is um, from Help Home. And they have crisis lines, phone, clothing, outreach. So it's a really great resource. And then the homeless information for Nevada, which is HUD. This is new, it's tailoring treatment for social context um, for migrant and seasonal agricultural workers. They have a higher risk of type 2 diabetes than overall population. They're mostly Latino and they're usually living in severe poverty. They have food insecurity and chronic stress. Uh, the Department of Labor estimates two and a half to three million agricultural workers travel throughout the country. And some barriers they may face include migration, cultural or linguistic barriers, lack of transportation and money, lack of work hours, unfamiliarity with new community and access to resources. And if you want to learn more about diabetes and a migrant health, there are some resources I found. I just looked these up and migrant 
Migrant Clinicians Network, National Center, Farm Worker Health, and Farm Worker Justice are just some sites I found looking up this work. And if you're wondering um, what kind of crops grow in Nevada, like do we really have a, a, a migrant um, seasonal agricultural worker here in Nevada? Um, Nevada produces potatoes, barley, uh, winter and spring wheat, corn, oats, onions, garlic, and honey. And then on smaller acreage, we do mint, fruits, vegetables um, are grown throughout our state. Um, we're, Nevada is one of the agricultural uh, centers of the country based on size of land, including beef and veal and other plant products, feed feeds and feed grains. So there is a huge population um, here in Nevada of migrant and seasonal agricultural workers. And so this definitely applies to us here in Nevada. For language barriers, um, there's the National Standards for Culturally Linguistically Appropriate Services or CLAS or CLAS for health and healthcare. And what we wanna do is provide um, advanced health equity, improve quality, help eliminate care disparities and establish a blueprint for health and healthcare organizations. Um, health Reach provides multilingual and multicultural patient education material. And there are um, new laws coming out now that we should be able to provide our materials in multiple languages. And then community support. The um, healthcare community linkage, linkages include the community health worker. A community health worker has become more and more um, desirable to have with your organization. They are peer supporters. They're the lay leaders. They're the ones that are actively um, in the community and they are a bridge between um, me as a healthcare provider and helping that patient receive the services within the community. So finding a, a community health worker to work with your organization is very advantageous. So why am I spending so much time on tailoring context to care? I'm thinking, why is she going over this? And why have I not read this before? So this is a great time to learn about that. Is when you look at the decision cycle for patient-centered care um, and treating patients with diabetes, the very first box and the way into patient care is you have to look at the patient's current lifestyle. Um, what are their comorbidities, clinical characteristics, issues such as motivation, dep depression, and the very last one is cultural and socioeconomic context. You need to know your patient. You need to know what it's gonna be a barrier for their care and what they can and cannot meet as a goal. You need to consider specific factors that impact the patient's choice of treatment. And that is where the social um, context come into play because if they can't afford the medication, they're not gonna take it. If they're homeless and can't use insulin because they can't store it. Um, if, if they're traveling around and moving because of a migrant issue, then you're not gonna see them again. So understanding where they fall into this regimen is gonna help you provide a better uh, patient care context. Um, making a shared decision management plan means that you have to talk to the patient and have their support. And finally, you gotta agree on the management plan. And as you implement this plan, it requires follow-up and uh, reassessment. This is the usual table that um, even I as a pharmacist, when the new 2020, the new standards of diabetes care come out each year, usually in January, uh, January, this is the usual page I go to is, okay, what changes to medication management um, are made this year? Um, last year, they identified um, the, they kind of isolated um, ASCVD, heart failure and kidney disease, chronic kidney disease as a um, point of care for, um, highlighting the new use of SGLT2 inhibitors, um, the use of when to use a GLP-1 um, RA. And again, this year they kind of did further um, designation of which SGLT2 to use. And that's usually based on the uh, cardiovascular outcome trials. In addition to if they're not in this category, then we go over to patient tailor care. Um, can they afford the plan? Are we looking for weight loss? What, what are we tailoring the care to? And don't forget that the first line typically is a metformin with lifestyle uh, management, which includes weight reduction and physical activity. So how does this affect um, 
making decisions about patient care is understanding when, when it's appropriate and what first line therapy to use um, for treatment of um, ASCVD factors, the heart failure and chronic care, uh, chronic kidney disease. And so taking some time and looking at when ASCVD predominates, adding the GLP-1 uh, receptor agonist or the SGLT2 inhibitor and that has to be one that with proven cardiovascular disease benefit. Um, if heart failure predominates, then it's typically the SGLT2-1 um, inhibitor is recommended for HEFREF. And if uh, CKD predominates, then you want to have the SGLT2 with the evidence of CVD benefit. And if they can't take that, then use a GLP-1 RA. CVO CV Cardiovascular um, outcome trials are, were first based off of um, 2008 when rosiglitazone or Avandia was withdrawn from the market. And from that for, point forward, um, whether the research was already in place or future research, the cardiovascular uh, disease benefit or um, cause of problems was now investigated. And so this is where we are with all the, from 2013 to 2020 of all the different trials. And that is where the SGLT2 inhibitors are coming from the benefit for cardiovascular disease for heart failure and chronic kidney disease. Um, it's very interesting. I put the link for the journal below if you want to read more on CVOTs. ASCVD risk factor, if you don't have the, calculator as a um, download on your phone or go to the online. This is where you can identify the risk assessment based on age or um, health condition and when to add a statin therapy um, based on or modify their um, blood pressure medication or you want to add aspirin to reduce their ASCVD uh, risk factor. So this is a really great resource um, but it does have limitations. It has limitations based on age. It has limitations um, based on um, ethnicity. It depends on what you're putting into the calculator. If you're not familiar with this um, ASCVD risk estimator, it's a really great resource. Um, I actually used it today when I was at the clinic um, calculating, you know, should we um, put somebody on uh, start a statin therapy or not based on age and risk. And so it's a great way to discuss modifiable, non-modifiable non factors with patients. Um, and it's a really great way to communicate with your providers making recommendations. It does require you to have um, information such as their blood pressure and their um, cholesterol lab work. So it does take a little bit more information, but it does help you make better uh, care plan. And then we have the um, initiating blood pressure medications, which now is based on the albuminuria, which if it's less than 300, it's suggested to have an ACE. And if it's over 300, it's strongly recommended to add the ACE or the ARB. And so this has its own algorithm. But what I always like to emphasize is lifestyle management is still important, just as with the medication um, algorithm with metformin and lifestyle management, we can't forget that aspect of educating patients and taking the opportunity to talk to them about um, reducing salt in their diet, watching the cholesterol in their diet, increasing their activity. And so that's always an opportunity to talk to patients. Um, after starting their therapy, um, assessing when to add additional therapy, these are great algorithms. If you haven't had a chance to look at them, you may wanna spend some time on your 2021 guidelines. And then finally, the diabetes self-management education and support for adults with type 2 diabetes. This is an algorithm of care. So I spend time looking at finding resources for patients who might need additional education, um, nutrition with a dietitian, or emotional health, mental health, if they need help. And one thing I found that with working with my current projects with Dignity Health and Roseman, I am able to refer patients um, out to dietitians or out to uh, clinical care and then have people referred to me. So one of my first programs I work with is with Dignity Health. It's a MTM service. It's grant funded, so I don't bill insurance. I don't charge the patient. And if they have diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, 
patients have been referred to me to offer them a medication review. Um, most recently, I was awarded a, a grant through Dignity Health through the Ryan White Part A program. And this allows me to work with patients who are newly diagnosed um, or currently diagnosed with HIV who may have um, adherence problems. And I collaborated with Emoca, which is a app that provides direct observational therapy monitoring. And I also offer patient support group classes where we discuss health education topics um, for reduction of um, HIV or other topics they're interested in. With um, Roseman, I'm working with the Roseman University of Health Sciences College of Pharmacy out of the MTM Call Center. This is a grant funded program where um, there's five of us on the team and we provide these services free to Nevada residents and you're welcome to call for appointments. You can also email me if you'd like to refer somebody and I can get them um, an appointment with um, a pharmacist. In addition, I work with Roseman Medical Group and the appointments are team-based. Uh, I don't have a collaborative practice agreement with them, but I do have the approval to work with them. And I go in and I work with patient with um, integrated into their healthcare system uh, for their medical records. So I can see labs, I can see notes and um, any planned care that um, I find is signed off on by the provider. And it's a coordinated patient care plan, which is really exciting and um, beneficial and provides patient education for those who have high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol. And you're welcome to call Rose Medical Group for appointments. With the um, Dignity Health, they have a CDC recognized lifestyle change program. And this is the diabetes prevention program. They identify patients either out and about at their community um, health uh, fairs by filling out this um, risk form. And then during COVID they did it virtually, but they're opening the wellness centers now so more patients can actually go um, in person to those appointments. They have other um, hypertension and heart health, heart health management programs, including the healthy heart program, self-measured blood pressure, fruit and vegetable prescription program for those who might be food insecure, and learning how to eat for a healthy heart. Again, if any of these programs you think that your patients may benefit from or you want to learn more about them, there's a phone number here. And finally, with the MTM Patient Lifestyle Education, um, I collaborate with the Dignity Health, it's called Nevada QTAC, and I use different um, ways to identify how to help patients understand diet, exercise, weight reduction, tobacco use, and using other resources to improve patients' outcomes. There are many DM, uh, diabetes um, self-management education services and support here in Southern Nevada, including you can do the D, uh, CDC DSME toolkit if you wanna learn more about uh, self-management. There's the Diabetes Educator Program Locator, which you can find certified or approved programs here in Southern Nevada and Northern Nevada. There's the Nevada uh, Wellness, which is the program I work for and their programs, along with assistance for resources for um, finding affordable insulin, affordable um, medications. There's also Dispensary of Hope here for the volunteers of Southern Nevada. And of course, um, different companies um, offer assistance programs such as uh, Novo Nordisk offers Cornerstone for Care and lilydiabetes.com, and there's other ones that you may be able to find or know of. Again, those are um, not all encompassing, they're just ones that I'm familiar with. What about expanding services for the future? How can you help make a difference in the health of Nevadans? You can join one of our uh, state associations. There's Nevada Pharmacy Alliance and Nevada Society of Health System Pharmacists. Um, that is one way to help advance pharmacist uh, profession here in Nevada and the care of patients. And currently in legislation right now, we have Senate bills to identify ways that we can help patients here in Nevada, including allowing pharmacists to prescribe hormonal contraceptives, which is Senate Bill 190. Senate Bill 229 allows for the improved process to attain a collaborative practice agreement in Nevada. And Senate Bill 325, um, which allows pharmacists to prescribe medications to prevent HIV infection. Some questions you may wanna ask yourself or I'm always willing to discuss 
is what's the future of Pharmacy Nevada? I have an MTM work group as part of my grant work. And if you'd like to be part of an organization or um, part of a pharmacy group that you would like to meet, or even if you're not pharmacy and you're out in the community, you're welcome to call or email me if you'd like to become a member of our MTM work group, which meets quarterly. And at this time, I'd like to turn it back over to Brenda to see what questions we might have from the audience. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Bowman. That was an amazing presentation. What incredible resources. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. It's fantastic. Um, so now for our participants, as a reminder, if you have any questions, um, please go ahead and submit them via the q and icon. Um, and we also do have a few questions. We can start with one now. Um, you can also send questions directly to me or you can put them in the chat. Um, so our first question is, uh, how are you able to work in the community with other organizations as a licensed pharmacist? Oh, that's a good question. So I talk a lot about working out in the community and I do this um, with the approval of the State Board of Pharmacy. I had to complete a, um, some questions that they ask and currently I have to meet in person at one of their meetings and have their approval to um, work with these organizations, um, which is it's great that we are doing that, but also every time I get a new grant, I have to go back and appear before them. So that's something that the more pharmacists that get out and, and do work like this, we may be able to affect change on how uh, pharmacists are able to work in the community. Makes sense. All right, let's see. Another question is, how are patients being referred to the different MTM services that you offer in the community? That's another good question. So patients can come from um, different providers um, from the Dignity Health. Um, I get dietitians who send me their patients who are, need help with their questions, have complex questions. Flyers are put out in about a different locations around town from the wellness centers, and that's how I've had referrals there. And now, um, when I work with the clinic, uh, Rosemary Medical Clinic, the provider herself creates the appointment for me to work with her on. So my referrals come from various resources and avenues. But I think the more important thing is the more this becomes um, understood and how pharmacists help patients and help providers, I think that um, that process will um, improve. Absolutely. All right, again, if anyone has any other questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, at this point, we have one more. What is an example of a success story providing MTM services with Dignity Health or Rosemont? So a success story would be, um, I, I worked with a patient who had multiple um, uh, herbals and vitamins, and we were able to figure out that she, during quarantine, was depressed and started a uh, over-the-counter medication that interacted with her blood pressure. And she wouldn't have known that um, it was affecting her blood pressure. She wasn't monitoring it. And she didn't have a, a future appointment for three to four months down the road. And so a simple thing that you go over the counter and pick up to help out may have impacted her health. Brenda, I do see one question in the Q&A about, so how do I uh, provide MTM for vaccines? Vaccine, um, every time I have an MTM um, encounter with a patient, I do a gap in care uh, where I ask them about their, now I include COVID, but I always ask based on their age or their disease state, are they getting flu shots? Are they getting shingles? Are they doing pneumonia, hepatitis B? Have they updated their Tdap? Um, I think every interaction or every conversation with a, a patient um, allows us to close those gaps of care. Then maybe they may not be asked at the doctor's office. They may not be aware they're eligible. So um, part of the MTM process is to include questions and address those gaps in care um, for, for immunizations. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions? We'll give it just another second or so for you to type in any questions you have in the Q&A. All right. Well, I will say um, thank you again to Dr. Bowman. Um, all attendees will receive a PDF of today's slides, which are invaluable, I think. Uh, and we'll also send you the YouTube recording link in the coming days. Um, Dr. Bowman, you truly are 
a subject expert, my goodness. Um, we really appreciate your time. Thank you too to everyone who attended. Uh, we will look forward to seeing you all again at the next Roadrunner Resource Series, which is going to be in August. We will be dark for a few months over the summer. Um, until then, if you have any suggestions for topics or speakers, please do let us know. You can just send an email to alumni at roseman.edu. And with that, thank you everyone. Thank you again, Dr. Bowman. Have a fantastic evening.